Good afternoon, good evening, and good morning to our friends in Japan. My name is Jackie Cabasso. I'm the executive director of the Western States Legal Foundation in Oakland, California, and a national co-convener of United for Peace and Justice. I'm pleased to welcome you on behalf of the sponsoring organizations, American Friends Service Committee Northeast Region, Campaign for Peace, Disarmament, and Common Security, Peace Action, Rosa Luxemburg Stiftung, United for Peace and Justice, and Western States Legal Foundation, with the support of Hidankyo, the Japan Confederation of A and H bomb sufferers organizations, and Gensukyo, the Japan Council Against Atomic and Hydrogen Bombs. I will be moderating today, along with Joseph Gerson with the American Friends Service Committee and the Campaign for Peace, Disarmament, and Common Security. This webinar on the 75th anniversary of the atomic bombings, deconstructing the myths and promoting a nuclear weapons free and just world is taking place at an incredible unprecedented time. One year ago, who could have imagined a global pandemic, economic collapse and massive racial justice uprisings? Changes both bad and good are happening incredibly fast and there is a new openness to critically examining the US history of racism and violence. Now is a good time to take a critical look at the official US justification that the atomic bombings of Hiroshima and Nagasaki were necessary to end the war and save American lives. <clears throat> we are very fortunate to have with us preeminent historian Gar Alperowitz to help us do that. We're also very honored to have Mr. Suechi Kido who experienced and lived to tell his firsthand experience of the Nagasaki bomb, and who will share with us what it's been like to live through the pain and st stigma of the atomic bombing and to organize with other hibaksha to lead the call for the elimination of nuclear weapons. Finally, we are extremely pleased to have Reverend Liz Theo Harris with us, co-chair of the Poor People's Campaign, a national call for moral revival, who can help us examine the nature of US state violence today. The June 20th, 2020 Mass Poor People's Assembly and Moral March on Washington was the largest online gathering of poor and dispossessed people and people of conscience in the nation's history with more than two and a half million people viewing the program on Facebook alone. As we approach the 75th anniversaries of the US atomic bombings of Hiroshima and Nagasaki, let us be aware that today nearly 14,000 nuclear weapons most in order of magnitude more powerful than the bombs that destroyed Hiroshima and Nagasaki, continue to pose an intolerable threat to humanity and the dangers of wars among nuclear armed states are growing. The US is poised to spend nearly $2 trillion over the next three decades to maintain and upgrade its nuclear arsenal. All of the nuclear armed states are engaged in nuclear weapons modernization programs and an alarming but often overlooked factor is the increased scale and tempo of war games by nuclear armed states and their allies, including nuclear drills, ongoing missile tests and frequent close encounters between military forces of nuclear armed states, including the US and Russia, the US and China and India and Pakistan exacerbate nuclear dangers. Let us share our knowledge of the ever present and growing dangers of nuclear war and let us work together to understand the common causes of our current multifaceted crises as we work with the Poor People's Campaign and others to build the massive moral fusion movement we will need to overcome systemic state violence and build a peaceful, just, sustainable and inclusive world. Now it is my pleasure to introduce our first speaker. After our speakers, we'll open the floor for Q&A. Sueshi Kido was born in Nagasaki on January 21st, 1940. At age five, he was exposed to the atomic bomb on the street, just two kilometers from the blast center. Kido-san studied Japanese cultural history in the postgraduate course at Doshisha University. He taught in a women's college and is now a professor emeritus of the college in Jifu Prefecture, where he resides now. Since he established a Hibaksha Association in Jifu in 1991, Kido-san has dedicated himself to the Hibaksha movement. He succeeded Terumi Tanaka as Secretary General of Nihon Hidankyo, the Japan Confederation of A&H Bomb Sufferer Organizations in 2017. Kido-san. <laughs> 
人類を救おう日本避難局事務局長木戸玲一です新型コロナウイルスの世界的蔓延特にアメリカにおける深刻な状況にもかかわらずこのような貴重な国際会議を開催されたアメリカの平和運動の皆様に敬意を表します1945年8月9日私は長崎で被爆しました5歳でした被爆75年原爆で命を奪われた人を追悼し核兵器の廃絶に成功を傾けた先達に敬意を表し被爆者の願いと日本被弾協の運動を報告させていただきます1945年8月9日私は爆心地から約2キロメートルの自宅前路上に母や近所のお母さん方と一緒にいました飛行機の音を聞きました音が去った方を見上げた瞬間ピカドーン光を浴び爆風で約20メーター飛ばされ気を失いました母に抱かれて防空壕に運ばれました母は顔一面と胸をやけどしましたが不思議なことにその時の母の顔を全く覚えておりません防空壕は山の斜面を掘っただけの横穴でした天井から水がポタポタと落ちていました防空壕は逃げ込んできた副負傷者でいっぱいうめき声が満ちていました防空壕で父と姉に再会することができました。翌10日、母は問いたに寝かされ、私は籠に乗せられ、疎開地道のまで運ばれました。避難しが,しながら見た町には何にもありません。焼けた家の残骸もありません。町全体が黒かったという印象が残っています。道を進み、爆心地に近づくにつれ、道にも川にも死体がゴロゴロ、水を求める人の群れが続きました。姉はその時、水を求める人を脇目に、ごめんね。ごめんねとコロナ禍でつぶやきながら通り過ぎていったと言ってます。原爆が作り出した世界は誰にも予想できなかったそして二度と起こってはいけない人類が滅びるとその時の地獄でした。原爆は広島と長崎を一瞬にして死の町に変えました。赤く焼けただれて膨れ上がった屍の山。眼球や内臓の飛び出した死体。黒焦げの満員電車。倒れた家の下敷きになり、生きながら焼かれた人々。髪を逆立て、ずるむけの皮膚をぶら下げた幽霊のような行列。人の世の出来事とは到底言えない無残な光景でした。我が子や親を助けることも、生死をさまよう人に水をやることもできませんでした。人間らしいことをやれなかった、その悔しさ、辛さは生涯忘れることができません。一旦、死の淵から逃れた人もまた、家族探しや救援に駆けつけた人たちも放射能に侵され次々に髪が抜け血を吐いて倒れていきました日本を占領した米軍は原爆に関する報道を禁止し
被爆者の発言や出版を弾圧、専門家、医学者などの調査研究にさえ圧力を加えました。日本政府は戦時災害保護法を打ち切り、緊急救護所を閉鎖し、被爆者は焼け野が花に放り出されたのです。それから12年、被爆直後のもっとも援護が必要だった時期、日本政府は被爆者に対して何の対策も取らず、放置し、見捨てました。1954年のビキニ事件で日本国民は原水爆の恐怖を知りその禁止を求める運動が広がりました同時に広島長崎の被爆者はどうしてるんだと思い起こされました被爆から10年目の1955年に広島で開かれた第1回原水爆世界大会で被爆者が訴えましたあの日から10年毎日毎日が苦しみの日でした戦争さえなかったら原爆さえなかったらこんな惨めな姿にはならなかったのですどうかここにお集まりの皆さんこういう苦し,苦しみを繰り返さぬようにどうか皆さんこの訴えは、再び被爆者を作るな、核戦争を起こすな、核兵器なくせ、原爆被害への国家保障を、と求める被爆者の要求の原点です。1956年8月10日、日本被弾協が結成されました。その結成戦、世界への挨拶は次のように述べています。私たちがこのような立ち上がりの勇気を得ましたのは、全く昨年8月の世界大会の賜物であります。私たちの胸に積もった悲しみと怒り、悩みと苦しみについての尽きることのない語り合いは、語り合いは決してひとときの慰めや、気休めのたためでではありませんでした手をつないで決然と立ち上がるためのほかなりませんでした。世界に訴うべきは訴え、国家に求むべきは求め、自ら立ち上がり、互いに愛すくう道を講ずるためでありました。かくて私たちは自らを救うとともに、私たちの体験を通して人類の危機を救おうという決意を誓い合ったのであります。日本被弾協は結成当初から核兵器の廃止を求める国際活動を行ってきました。各国と国連に代表を派遣しました。77年 NGO 被爆者問題新報を開催し、原爆被害を全面的に解明しました。国連軍縮総会に参加し、演説しました。ヨハネ・パウロ法王にも謁見しました。核兵器の実験に抗議・中止するよう、核保有5カ国に代表を送りました。ベースを首脳会談に合わせ、レーガン・ゴルパフ・ゴルバチョフ両首脳に面会を求めました。また、パンフレット被爆者を発行し、120カ国に普及しました。IPB、IPPNW、IALNA などとも,とともに、国際司法裁判所に核兵器の要請を問うキャンペーンを行いました。1996年、国際司法裁判所は、核兵器の使用、威嚇は、一般的には国,葬国際法違反との勧告的意見を出しました
これらのすべての行動で伝えた広島の被爆者の体験、被弾橋調査、実践の報告は具体的で生々しく、特に1982年 SNS の山口千里さんの演説は、世界の多くの人に大きな感銘を与えました。2013年、14年に3回にわたる核兵器の人道の上の影響に関する国際会議が開かれました。被爆者の訴えが核兵器の廃絶への道は後戻りできないという会議の基調を作り出したと評価されました。これらの会議を受け、2016年4月、世界各地に住む被爆者救死が呼びかける。被爆75年の2022年までに核の兵器の廃絶を願う広島・長崎の被爆者が訴える被爆者国際署名運動を始めました世界で数億の署名を集め国連に提出し世界市民の声で廃絶を実現しようという運動ですこの時私たちは2017年に核兵器禁止条約が採択されるなど全く予想していませんでした。しかし事態は急速に進み2016年に核兵器禁止条約に関するオープンエンド会議2017年に交渉会議が開かれました。日本被弾協はこのすべての会議に代表を送り、原爆被害の実相を伝え、核兵器禁止条約の採択に寄与しました。そして2017年4月7日、核兵器禁止条約が採択されました。核兵器の終わりの始まり、最も解決が難しい問題と考えられてきた核兵器の廃絶が、現実になる画期的な歴史的採択でした今人類は核兵器気候変動新型コロナウイルスという三大危機から人類を救う戦いを行っています人類を守るのは私ファーストの政治家や国家ではありません命と暮らしを守る世界市民の共同の取り組み、連帯です。非常に残念なことですが、唯一の戦争被爆国である日本の政府は、核兵器禁止条約に反対し、国の安全をアメリカの方に頼り、被爆者が求める原爆被害への国家保障を拒否しています。なぜ日本政府は核兵器禁止条約に背を向け被爆者の要求を拒否しているのでしょうか国民に戦争による犠牲を強制する政策に立っているからですこの戦争犠牲受理論は次のようなものですおよそ戦争という国の存亡をかけての非常事態のもとにおいては国民がその生命、身体、財産等について、その戦争によって何らかの犠牲を余儀なくされたとしても、それは国を挙げとの戦争による一般の犠牲として、すべての国民が等しく受任しなければならないというのです。日本国民は戦争による原爆投下で死ぬことも、苦しみや不安を抱えながら生きることも、戦争、犠牲として我慢せよこれが日本政府の核政策を決める根本的な考えです。戦後、被爆者に希望を与えたのは日本国憲法でした。とりわけ、政府の行為によって再び戦争の参加が起こることのないように決意し、全世界の国民が平和のうちに生存する権利を有することを確認した全文と、戦争放棄、戦力不保持、国の交戦権を否定した
第9条は被爆者にとって生きる支えでした。原爆被害への国家保障が国が戦争の責任を認めて被害を償い、二度と戦争を起こさない仕組みを作ることです。被爆者が原爆被害への国家保障を求め続けてきたのは、この憲法が国民に保障する自由及び権利は、国民の普段の努力によってこれを保持しなければならないと憲法12条で定められた主権者国民としての義務を遂行したものでもありました再び被爆者を作るな核戦争を起こすな核兵器なくせ原爆被害への国家保障は変わらぬ被爆者の願いです最後にアメリカの市民の皆さんに感謝の言葉を述べさせていただきます私たち被爆者はアメリカ政府の広島長崎への原爆投下を許しませんアメリカ政府は速やかに原爆投下を謝罪し核兵器を起こすとな,なくすための行動を起こさなければなりません。核兵器は決して二度と使われてはなりません。私たちのような被爆者を世界のどこでも作ってはなりません。被爆者を私たちも最後にしましょう。何度もニューヨークを中心にアメリカで証言しました。多くのアメリカの方々が熱心に私の話を聞いてくれるそして原爆が投下された事実は知っていたがその下で何が起こっていたかは知らなかった今日の話を聞いて私の人生が変わった今日の聞き手は明日の話で今日早速家族に友達に話をしますと語ってくれます皆さんの熱心に聞く態度感想を聞き私は元気になり生きる力をいただいております喜んでいます発言の機会を与えてくださりありがとうございました本当にありがとうございました。キラさん、Thank you very much for sharing your experience under the、uh, under the mushroom cloud,、uh, and you know, I hope that people here、uh, are is moved by what you've described as the hell of Hiroshima or the Nagasaki,、uh, as I have been over the years. I also want to just appreciate and hope others will now appreciate the role that Hidankyo has played in its demand uh, uh, for the abolition of nuclear weapons uh, and its truth that human beings and nuclear weapons cannot coexist. It's then my privilege to introduce Gar Puerovitz,、uh, who is perhaps best known、uh, for his path breaking and 1955 definitive work, The Decision to Use the Atom Bomb. Truman's deceitful rationalizations for his decision to order the atomic bombings have long served as a foundation for continuing preparations for nuclear war. As the 75th anniversaries of the atomic bombings and the end of the war approach, we are seeing the first stirrings of a wave of propaganda designed to prevent us from facing、uh, and learning from、uh, what were the two murderous and indiscriminate crimes of humanity committed by our government. So we are especially glad. Uh, to have Gora p u e r o v i t z to set the record straight. Professor p u e r o v i t z is the Lionel Bauman Professor of Political Economy at the University of Maryland and a founding principal of the Democracy Collaborative. He's also a former fellow of the Institute of Politics at Harvard and King's College at,、uh, at, Cambridge, at Cambridge University. He has served as legislative director in the U.S. House of Representatives and the U.S. Senate and as special assistant in the Department of State. His many articles have appeared in publications ranging from the New York Times and the Washington Post 
to the Journal on Economic Issues, Foreign Policy, and Diplomatic History. Gar, thank you for joining us. The cyber waves are yours. Thank you. Thank you very much. And uh, thank you, all of my panelists as well, who join us today. Um, I wish I could say that the American discussion of the history of the bombing of Hiroshima has been uh, thoughtful and reflective and knowledgeable about what actually happened in those years. Um, a new book is now out by a very important uh, Fox News analyst, Chris Wallace, The Countdown 1945, and it rehearses the well-known myths by at least many, many historians that the bomb was absolutely necessary to produce a surrender, to prevent an invasion, to save a million lives. That mythology still persists despite uh, many, many, many attempts and many, many historical studies that show it to be a myth. So there's work to do. There's work to do on that front. There's also work to do on the expansion of nuclear weapons. We've seen more than a trillion dollar expenditure has been authorized, in fact, by the Obama administration and now even more by this administration to build more nuclear weapons, more than a trillion dollars committed now in the next period. So we face many, many problems. And I think that the anniversaries of the bombing of Hiroshima and Nagasaki is a moment when we could, we need to reflect much more deeply on actually what happened and how decision makers made their decisions. Uh, I've had the experience of working uh, in the United States Congress in both houses at the legislative director level and at a special assistant at the highest level of the State Department. And in that experience, one realizes how limited what happens within the government is unless there is citizen action. And so the story now of the decision to use the atomic bomb, which I will go through what we now know briefly and, and hopefully with a view to producing some further understanding of what citizens can do to make their governments, both here and in Japan, into reliable uh, entities building peace rather than building nuclear weapons. The first thing to understand is that, surprisingly, virtually every top US military leader from World War II, almost all of them, are now on record before their deaths, publicly stating that the use of the atomic bomb was totally unnecessary from a military point of view. This is not well known, but let me give you a few that the military themselves believe the bomb was totally unnecessary at the time it was used. Let me give you just a few quotations. Here's Admiral William D. Leahy, chairman of the Joint Chiefs of Staff at that time, and also the president's chief advisor and to the, in the White House. In being the first, the use of the barbarous weapon of, at Hiroshima and Nagasaki was no material assistance in our war against Japan. The Japanese were already defeated and ready to surrender. In being the first to use it, we anticipated and we adopted an ethical attitude, standard common to barbarians of the Dark Ages. I was not taught to make war in that fashion, and wars cannot be won by destroying women and children. That is the chairman of the Joint Chiefs of Staff in 1945, speaking about the necessity or the lack of necessity of using this weapon for any military purpose whatsoever at that time. Japan was already ready to surrender, he testifies. One of the most famous and most brutal hawks, the commander of the 21st Bomber Command, General Curtis LeMay, just after the bombing. The atomic bomb had nothing to do with the end of the war. The, the war was already over. The Russians were coming in after the bomb. It was totally unnecessary. And here is President Eisenhower, Chief Commander in Chief, Allied Commander in Europe. It wasn't necessary to hit them with that awful thing. In fact, virtually all of the military are on record now publicly from that period making that very clear. Unfortunately, a new book is out, Countdown 1945, by a Fox News analyst, Chris Wallace, very popular already on the, on the most popular list of the New York Times, which repeats in a very charming and interesting way all of the myths we now have about the bombings. And the reason it's important to challenge those myths with the words of the military leaders, 
with what we know about the history of the time is because, as has been mentioned, the United States is committed now to a trillion dollar expansion of nuclear weapons, which will force others to expand as well. And the arms race continues. So far, we've been lucky. But by destroying these myths, we can begin to reassess the importance of challenging the whole nuclear structure that is detrimental not only to the United States and Japan, but to the entire future of the world. Let me go back and give you just a bit of history about how all this happened. The, it was decided as early as April 1945, just to give you the picture of what was going on, US intelligence, military intelligence, stated very clearly, repeatedly advised the president again and again and again, that when the Soviet Union, Red Army, which had just defeated Germany, when they came into the war, almost certainly that would bring about surrender because the last of the great powers were in. The war was almost over already and the US intelligence knew it. And the final blow would bring about surrender. The president was so advised and so were all of the top military leaders. That's as early as April, 1945. The bombs were used in August. But the bomb building of the bomb continued and continued and continued. The bombs were tested on July 16th. We're about to reach that anniversary with great success. They gave the president a feeling of renewed power. And in particular, as he said, power against the Soviet Union and against Stalin in diplomatic matters were quite clear. If you read the diaries of the Secretary of War at that period, Henry L. Stimson, again and again and again, he speaks of the atomic bomb as a weapon of diplomacy, not only a weapon of war. And he speaks of it again as his master card of diplomacy against the Soviet Union at that time. The Cold War was already beginning before the hot war of World War II had ended. And in particular, also the chief advisor to the President of the United States, Secretary of State James F. Burns, who was dominant at that point. President Truman was a very, very kind of new figure to the White House. Burns was an old hand. He had taken Truman in hand. And by all accounts, James F. Burns, the Secretary of State, was the dominant figure in deciding to use the atomic bomb. He is on record meeting with atomic scientists in May of 1945. He understood that Japan was ready to surrender. And he understood that it was un that the bombing was totally unnecessary. But what he said to the scientists, but of course, this will allow us to make, quote, Russia more manageable in Europe, in particular in Eastern Europe. This kind of record again and again about whether or not the bomb could be stopped before Russia came into Manchuria and China or the negotiations in Europe is now well known amongst serious historians. The documents are very, very fruitful and very well developed. But so that the bomb was unnecessary, the military understood this. They understood the only condition was to allow the emperor to stay in a powerless role, something like the Queen of England. In fact, the proclamation warning Japan to surrender contained an assurance to the Japanese people and to the emperor that he would in fact be allowed to stay in a powerless role, a famous paragraph 12 for historians. Somehow or other, we believe by Secretary of State Burns, at the last minute, this necessary condition was, was removed, making it impossible at that moment in the diplomacy for the Japanese government to know what was, what was being offered, and certainly that they knew that they were not being given the assurances necessary that they believed to the god, the godlike emperor at that time had to be preserved. So the decision was made knowing that the proclamation warning to Japan to surrender could not be accepted. And when it was not, it was not rejected, it was said, we will study it. The Japanese word mokusatsu was used in discussing what to do with this, but it was not accepted and it was not rejected. That was taken as, as planned as an excuse to use the atomic bombs on August 6th and August 9th. Remember there were three months three months remaining before even the first preliminary landing could possibly occur. There was not much fighting going on at this time. The great invasion of Japan that was planned could not occur till April of 1946. You're talking about the bombings in August of 1945. 
so there was not going to be an invasion with massive casualties. This was all understood at the time. And what you find then is people aware then and subsequently at the highest levels, but certainly not in the American public, that the bombings were totally unnecessary from a military point of view and understood at the various highest level today. If you come to Washington and go to the US Naval Museum, not the Air Force Museum, you'll find an exhibit which pretty much says what I've just been saying, because the Navy, the old conservative Navy, was a, found this abhorrent, and the Naval Museum still maintains a small exhibit which basically said the war was over and the bombs were unnecessary. So that, that broad understanding of many, 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 many scholars, one, that the war was over, that Japan was suing for surrender, that it was understood the war would end long before an invasion could possibly take place, that the Russian attack, which the United States had invited before the atomic bomb was used, would certainly produce and trigger a, an end to the war long before any, and even the first landing, and certainly not the invasion could occur. All of the mythology we now have saying the bomb saved 100,000 lives, President Truman said 500,000, 250,000, many, many, many myths were produced in a what's called a sophisticated public relations effort after World War II. This is all now well documented as well, what it went on. So we have to go back and understand, and I think this is the issue for now. The United States is building a trillion dollar expansion of nuclear weapons. Somehow within the government, and I've served at quite high levels of the government, the mythology and the momentum begins to build. And somehow people convince themselves to do things that in any other life would be outrageous in any other circumstance. And in this one particularly, the actual killing of, of hundreds of thousands of people for no military reason whatsoever. That, that set of ideas that becomes guiding to certain people within the government has to be challenged by external citizen action. There is no way to break it. And I say, I speak of that as having been a, an official at the high level of the government and having developed legislation in both the United States Houses of Congress, the Senate and House of Representatives. The only answer to this is awareness of what the dangers are, awareness of how easily the his, his, bad decisions can be made and how his, his, history just demonstrates it, how mythologies can be promulgated even now in best-selling books. The only answer to that is the awareness that's beginning in the United States with regard to race, with regard to income inequality, with regard to climate change, but not yet, I'm afraid, not yet with regard to nuclear weapons. We've lived a long time since Hiroshima, so far with great luck that we've not seen the use of nuclear weapons with massive proliferation all around the world. But the lesson is that unless these weapons are contained and abolished, there cannot be peace. And certainly we cannot trust the internal strategies and stratagems of the bureaucracy within the government of which I was once a part. One must actually go only to citizen action and public and political attack challenge to these kinds of trends and this kind of decision making to bring awareness of the moral and ultimately humanitarian need to check nuclear weapons. Thank you very much. Thank you very much, um, Gar. That was for bringing us that very, very important history, but even more so for making such an eloquent case for popular mobilization the absolute necessity for popular mobilization. So it is now a great personal privilege to introduce the Reverend Dr. Liz Theo Harris, co-chair of the Poor People's Campaign, a national call for moral revival with Dr. William J. Barber II. She is the director of the Cairo Center for Religions, Rights and Social Justice at Union Theological Seminary. She has spent over two decades organizing amongst the poor in the United States. Uh, Reverend Theo Harris re received her BA in Urban Studies from the University of Pennsylvania, her Master's of Divinity from Union Theological Seminary in 2004, where she was the first William Sloan Coffin Scholar, and I take note that William Sloan Coffin was certainly a stalwart of the anti-nuclear movement, and her PhD from Union in New Testament and Christian Origins. She has been published in numerous newspapers, magazines, and books, she was named one of the Politico 50 thinkers, doers, and visionaries whose ideas are driving politics in 2018. 
Uh, Reverend Theo Harris is an ordained minister in the Presbyterian Church and teaches at Union Theological Seminary in New York City. Reverend Liz. Thank you so much. I uh, really appreciate the introduction, Jackie, and really appreciate um, being a part of this um, powerful presentation and conversation, um, especially with this amazing panel of, of leaders and thinkers. Indeed, it is, you know, so important for us to take time to learn lessons um, from the bombings of Hiroshima and Nagasaki, uh, to, to learn lessons about the lie and destruction of war and militarism. I was raised by a family that was very active in the anti-nuclear movement my whole life. We followed the words of Dr. King, who said that peace is not just the absence of tension, but the presence of, injust of justice. Uh, my family uh, taught me to listen to the Bible quote from Jeremiah, my people are broken, shattered, and yet they put on band-aids, saying it's not so bad, you'll be just fine, but things are not just fine. Our leaders say peace, peace, when there is no peace. And this is surely the case in the year 2020, the 75th anniversary of the bombing of Hiroshima and Nagasaki. As folks know, 2020 began with a near war with Iran, the deadly upshot of a bomb first, ask questions later approach to world affairs. Then came this pandemic, a public health disaster made all the more lethal by our the United States country's administration's utter indifference to the lives of the people, especially the poor and people of color. Then there were the murders of George Floyd and Breonna Taylor and Tony McDade and Armand Arbery and so many others, more names to the list of black lives that didn't matter to the US state. And then an eruption of righteous rage, even more police brutality in response. The lessons of these historic moments, months, is clear. Funneling trillions of dollars into institutions designed to violently protect the status quo, be they police or military, guns or bombs, does not make ourselves, our loved ones, our communities any safer. It's the lesson from the bombing of Hiroshima and Nagasaki 75 years ago. In the United States, as demands to demilitarize the police and redistribute funds to programs of social uplift gain traction, we need to similarly reimagine our approach to national security and world affairs. To create real security, we must slash the Pentagon budget. We must dismantle the war economy. We must stop the continued proliferation of atomic bombs and we in must invest instead in meeting everybody's basic human needs. The US war making budget is well over $700 billion a year. That's more than the next 10 countries combined, 53 cents of every discretionary dollar in our federal budget. Just for a little bit of comparison, when Donald Trump tried to kick 700,000 poor people off of life-saving food stamps programs this past year, it was justified by an expected saving of $1 billion. Every dollar spent on feeding this war machine is a dollar not spent on housing. It's not spent on healthcare or education, on jobs, or on preventing pandemics. It's not spent on confronting the climate uh, crisis, in a country that is beset by searing poverty, gaping inequality, and widespread environmental injustice, the overblown Pentagon budget is not just a case of mismatched priorities, but it's a war on the poor in the United States and across the world. The violent first approach to foreign and domestic policy does not address the root causes of conflict or unrest. It does not make the people of the United States safer and it certainly does not make the rest of the world safer. So at some point we must ask the question, who does this all serve? 
Nearly half of the money that flows into the Pentagon's overstuffed coffers goes straight to for-profit war corporations, corporations like Lockheed Martin, whose multi-million dollar lobbying spending is only matched by the excessive salaries of their top executives. Still more corporations plan to get rich off of post-invasion reorganization of different economies, whether it's Iraq or Afghanistan, whether it's Yemen. And meanwhile, the politicians that serve their interests rally support through jingoist slogans, the scapegoating of foreigners. But in short, as the modern system of policing is used to suppress black, brown, and poor communities in order to protect private property and preserve existing hierarchy of the power, so does the war economy. This is all happening in a society where nearly half of the US population is poor or low income. There are 87 in uninsured and underinsured people in the United States, 62 million workers who make less than a living wage, 15 million families who can't afford water and 4 million whose water is poisoned. There are upwards of 12 million homeless people in this, the richest country in the world. And although the United States does not have a military draft, we have a poverty draft where many young people have no potential of getting an education or stable employment without joining the military. Thousands of communities are contaminated by petrochemical companies, industrial waste and raw sewage, all made worse by climate change and the militarization and destruction of the earth. Using the US Census Bureau's supplemental poverty measure, there are at least 140 million people who are poor or just one $400 emergency from poverty. These include family farmers who live in food deserts with their rural hospitals closing, moms who have had to bury their children, not because they were called home by God, but because they have no health care. Teenagers whose homeless encampments have been bulldozed by the police and white supremacist militias. Native Americans whose sacred lands are being mined by multinational extractors. According to our Souls of Poor Folk Audit of America, the poor or low income today consists of 24 million Black people, 38 million Latinos, 8 million Asian Americans, 2 million Native peoples, and 66 million poor white people. These staggering numbers, already a dead weight for the nation, are starting to prove to be a grotesque underestimate in this coronavirus world. In the last few decades, unemployment, underemployment, poverty, and homelessness have become ever more deeply and permanently structured into United States society. Over the years, one political narrative has been trumpeted by both parties in the US is that we don't have enough to provide for everyone. But this scarcity argument has undergirded every federal budget in recent her history, and yet it falls flat when we look at the fact that 53% of every federal discretionary dollar goes to the Pentagon, that trillions of dollars have been squandered in this country's never ending wars, and not to speak of the unprecedented financial gains the wealthiest have made, even in the midst of this pandemic. What we've seen over the past months is that the US government has funneled trillions of dollars into the Wall Street and into corporations, leaving still tens of millions of people completely left out of any stimulus. And months later now, we have moratoriums on evictions that are expiring, sending potentially 23 million people to, with eviction papers by September. Because the bailout has gone primarily to the rich and because of a failing public infrastructure and an administration that has failed to stop the pandemic, now the US military is infecting military bases across the world, including as folks I'm sure have heard in Okinawa. The crises and pandemics of poverty and racism and inequality and COVID-19 alongside war and the destruction of the earth are revealing ever more clearly now how the descent into poverty is helping to destroy American society from the inside out. But isn't it then time to demand a transformative moral agenda that reaches from the bottom up? 75 years after the whole scale destruction wrought by the bombing of Hiroshima and Nagasaki, isn't it time now for peace and for justice? <laughs> 
If the U.S. shrank our war economy, eliminating nuclear weapons and cutting U.S. military bases in countries across the world, if we had a fair taxation system for the rich and corporations, if we forgave debts and invested in universal health care, living wages, and a guaranteed income, decent and affordable housing, strong programs for the poor, we could indeed end poverty. We could indeed turn our war economy into a peace economy. This crisis is offering us a striking demonstration of how an economy oriented around the whims of the rich and the drums of war brings death and destruction everywhere in its wake. A society organized around the needs of the poor, on the other hand, could improve life for us all. And maybe in this moment, this is possible. This is why the Poor People's Campaign, a national call for moral revival is building power amongst those who are poor and marginalized and hurting. We've, we have an understanding that to address poverty, we must simultaneously address five interlocking injustices, systemic racism, poverty, ecological devastation, the war economy, and this distorted moral narrative of religious nationalism. And we've seen in, in history that whenever we faced forces of regression, moral movements have arisen to call us to higher ground. In every generation, we've needed a fusion movement where people can come together through our deepest moral values to build an agenda, an agenda that promotes earth rights, immigrant rights, poor people's rights, women's rights, all human rights. But we know that just articulating this agenda isn't enough. We need activism and we need to disrupt the forces of injustice. There indeed is a moral uprising, a new and unsettling force of people who are refusing to give up refusing to settle and surrender to suffering, a force of people who believe in fusion, who are united by morals, who are crying out, somebody is hurting our people. It has gone on far too long and we won't be silent anymore. 2020 began with an almost war, then a pandemic, then more murders, but then came an uprising. As demands grow to redirect money away from the police and toward the building blocks of a more just, equitable society, we can do the same for this war economy. Our security will not come from the reach of a bomb, but from the voice of a movement. Hiroshima teaches us this, this. Minneapolis teaches us this. Nagasaki teaches us this. Louisville teaches us this. Let us learn and let us organize together. Thank you very much. Thank you, uh, Reverend Theo Harris. Uh, really quite, quite remarkable talk. Um, you know, I think you really underlined the, the reality of the, you know, the, the same roots of war, oppression, and nuclearism. Uh, and as with Martin Luther King, uh, the call for a fusion unified movement if we are to prevail. I also, I want to thank you and I want to uh, say that I'm sorry that you're going to have to leave us for the Q&A period. Uh, and I wish you, the, you know, the you and the Poor People's Campaign, uh, to really to prevail in in, in re really your glorious and um, um, I say pathbreaking uh, important work. I mean, the, the the unity of issues by the Poor People's Campaign, you know, I think, is really a model for all of us. So thank you very much. With that, with that, I'm going to turn to the question and answer uh, phase of our of our webinar. A number of people have uh, posted questions in the Q and A uh, box at the bottom of your screen. If you have questions but haven't done so already, uh, please do so. I'm going to start with, uh, with with several questions, uh, asking for clarification about something which took me quite a long time uh, to fully understand. Uh, so the question to Kido-san uh, is: uh, What kind of compensation have the Hibakusha received? And who is responsible for providing that um, that compensation? Uh, the Japanese government, or the U.S. government, or both? Yes. Ah,あのね、この被爆者に対する補償ということですけども。あの、実はね、あの、日本政府が被爆から 
。そして、その法律の対象は、すべての原爆の被害者ではありません。法律で極めて限られた条件のもとに、ある被害者を、法律で被爆者と定めて、その被爆者だけに一定の医療上の保障をしたと、援護をしたという、そういう内容です。ですから、その原爆による広島、長崎の原爆による被害者が、被爆者と定められた人とそれ以外の人という具合に、まあ、区分される、分けられるという、そういう,う制度。で非常に私たちが求めるすべての原爆被害者にあるいは戦争被害者への国の償い保証をしなさいという要求とは非常にまず違うということをあのご理解いただきたいと思います。その上であの非常に最初は限られた医療上の援護施策でしたけども、非常に限られたものでしたけども、被爆者の長年の運動によって、少しずつ、少しずつ改善され、えー、多くの医療費が自己負担なく受けられるというようなところまで来ているということです。ですけども、先ほど申し上げましたような、本当に被爆者を作らないために国の償いを原爆被害への国の償いをという私たちの願いとは本質的にかけ離れた援護施策にとどまっているというアメリカからはもちろん何の,あの保証というものも受けておりませんで以上でいいでしょうかはい。is contrary to what one might expect, because to the extent there was any speaking and advice given by scientists, there were a number of very active scientists who tried to stop the bombing. A famous meeting with a man named Leo Zillard, who was the scientist who got Albert Einstein to convince President Roosevelt to start the Manhattan Project to build the atomic bomb. At that point, there was fear Germany, Hitler might get one, and it was absolutely essential for the United States to build a bomb. It was thought, and it was a, not an unreasonable idea given the nature of the Hitler regime. So that was the first sign of scientific activity. As the near ending of the war came about, there was a committee of scientists, particularly out at Los Alamos, where the atomic bomb was developed, which was urging some form of peace or some form of possibly not using the weapon. It was a little vague in its conclusion and its advocacy, but nonetheless, the direction was a direction towards questioning the necessity of the use. Now, remember, they did not know anything about the secret negotiations that were going on or the, the cables that the code had been broken. The president knew what the Japanese 
uh, government was saying to its ambassadors. They did not know that the inside people at the top understood Japan was trying to find desperately a way out of the war. But the scientists in general, and there were large numbers of them who felt that way. I mentioned the quotation from the Secretary of State that he wanted to use the atomic bomb, that he knew the war was over, that the use of the atomic bomb was really aimed at the Russians. This was Secretary of State Burns, who was the dominant figure. He was President Truman's top advisor. And indeed, President Truman was a novice. He had just come into office. He didn't know much. Burns had been there for many, many years running the war economy. And when he was in the Senate, he had taken this young senator from Missouri, Senator Truman, under his wing and became his patron and his advisor. And so the dominant figure at this point is uh, James F. Burns, the Secretary of State, uh, something like Richard Nixon in the early period of the George Bush, the third, second George Bush administration, at the very early period, uh, that man, uh, the Vice President, Dick, uh, Dick uh, Cheney, dominated the early thinking. And, and similarly, at this point, the man, man in charge was James F. Burns. Overriding the opinion of the military, as I've said, that from a military point of view, the war was basically over and unlikely to, to continue. So that's the dominant view. And his view was almost totally oriented towards the Soviet Union, both in Manchuria and in, and in Western Europe and in Eastern Europe. So that's the, pic the picture that emerges at that time. So you, you didn't have the scientists actively enough beyond four or five of them uh, demanding this, uh, but some did. And I was asked to speak at a conference that MIT had in 1972. It's called the March 4th Movement at MIT, the Center of American Scientific Technology and Leadership. And you know, it was interesting because some of the scientists there felt, well, we didn't know anything about it. And of course, the point was that if you wanted to find out, as some of the top scientists did, who got to speak to, to Secretary Burns directly, and found out what he thought directly, the scientists could find out. And it's important for both scientists and citizens to realize that there are very few secrets of this kind that are kept secret. The big issues, we are building a trillion dollar expansion of military budget on nuclear weapons alone. That's public knowledge. The scientists found out, the ones who wanted to in 1945, why the Secretary of State was thinking about using the atomic bomb, as he said, to make the Russians more manageable in Europe. If you wanted to, and one ought to speak not only to scientists, but citizens, it's possible to find these things out. There are no real secrets about the really big things. The real question, and I certainly agree with the last two speakers, is whether or not citizens take action to raise these questions, to learn about them, and to demand change. So that's, that's the picture from that period in 1945. So um, thank you, Gar. And the next question is to you as well, and maybe relates to how we, we build that movement uh, to not only prevent the, a nuclear war, but to rid ourselves of nuclear weapons. Uh, the question is, uh, to what degree, uh, in, in your thinking, uh, have the horrors of Hiroshima and Nagasaki uh, played a role uh, in keeping us from going into the, plunging into the depths of the abyss? Uh, in a sense, to what degree do you think building around the, uh, the horrors, the knowledge of what happened in Hiroshima and Nagasaki uh, plays a role uh, in, in, in our um, uh, people saving humanity from ourselves? You know, it's a very, very difficult question because on the one hand, I'm sure that the bombs, as we know them, the only two uses, have threatened and made people aware. Uh, so that's certainly true. And it may have played a role in people fearing the use of the weapons. On the other hand, there have been many, many, many military tests and explosions and demonstrations worldwide at the early period in 1945 and 46 and 47 again and again and again, the power of the weapon was shown in non-use, not against citizens, but in destroying battleships and destroying Bikini Islands, 
So we could have had that lesson another way, I believe. I think that the issue was so obvious once you began to see the extreme power of these weapons. And by 1949, they were hydrogen bombs, even many, many, many times more powerful. So it, I don't think the argument can be made that the bombing of Hiroshima saved us from the dangers of nuclear weapons. I think that danger could have been put forward in a very different, very different way. It, that what we're now seeing, as I said earlier, is an extraordinary buildup of nuclear weapons that it somehow doesn't make the, make the public. Uh, I was a supporter of the Democratic administration of President Obama, but before he left, he committed a trillion dollars to the expansion of nuclear weapons. And that's been more than expanded on by this administration. So I think what, and I would again go back to what I said, but also what the last speaker said, the building up of not only the poor people's campaign, but the reopening of a citizen's discussion of military issues and nuclear issues in particular is the only way you can get to these issues. And it's time, it's time for us to begin that again in a much more serious way than we've had been able to do for many, many years. Only smaller groups, very important groups, the friends have been really key to this. A number of religious groups have been important, but we need to rebuild a movement that begins to take this on in a much more serious way, just as we're taking on the poor people's campaign and climate change. Nuclear weapons has been, we've been very silent about it, and it's time to build, rebuild that movement. So, uh, Kiro-san, I'm gonna ask you two related questions. The first one is, um, as a preface, we citizens in the US are fully responsible from doing all we can to halt the nuclear weapon industry. From your in-depth experience, what needs to happen for the Japanese citizens to have their government stop their deep cooperation and encouragement of the West, especially USA, nuclear weapons industry? And a related question is from a different person, why do the Japanese people allow the USA to maintain bases in Japan so many years after the end of World War II? And I know these are difficult questions. Yes. You talk. そうですね。あの<咳>直接答えることにならないかもしれませんけどもやっぱりあの私たち人間にとって核兵器とは何かということをあのぜひあの考える必要がまずあると。それはとにかく破壊と、まあ、人類を滅ぼすという絶滅というかそれしか核兵器はあないんだとういうことですねで、えー、そういう意味で、あのー、私たちはあの日の私たちは体験したんですけども同時に全ての人間がやっぱり核兵器と向き合って、えー、そして人間らしく生きるということが核兵器と共にできるのかとそれは絶対にできないんだと。いうことをあの確認したいという具合にあの思います。で、日本政府がなぜアメリカと手を結んでるかという点で、えー、私は一つはね、近代日本がずっと続けてきた戦争という、その戦争に対して、戦争によって日本国民、あるいはアジアの人々、を犠牲にしていったそういうことに対する反省がないとこの自ら犯したその罪といいますかそれに対してきちんと向き合っていかなければこれはできないことじゃないか
、えー、日本国民としてはやはり日本のそのような先ほど戦争犠牲住人論と戦争が起きたらその犠牲は全ての国民が、えー、我慢しなければいけないんだというそういう考え方を変えさせていくと。でこれは日本国民全体がですねやはりあの力を合わせて大変回りくどいようですけどもやっぱり手をつなぎ合って政府を変えていくということしかないのではないかという具合に思ってます。でそういう中で本当に今基地その他その核兵器だとかその他にですねそういうもう非常にお金を使ってますけれどもそのお金と時を費やす時ではないと。とに命を守るために暮らしを守るためにお金を使う時だという具合に私は思います。あのこうしたらいっぺんによくなるというその薬はないと思うんですけどもやっぱり社会を動かすのは世界市民日本で言えば日本国民だアメリカで言えばアメリカ国民だという具合に思っておりますはい以上です
powerful weapons. And so far we've been lucky, but I don't think our luck is forever unless there's a movement that begins to control these weapons. Uh, okay, so this is, oh, <laughs> we we're both <laughs> unmuted at the same time. Okay, so I think this is probably our last question and it's for you again, Gar, but several people have asked it in different ways and I think it's very relevant to this particular set of presentations. Um, do you believe that President Truman's decision to use the atomic bombs in Japan, despite opposition from over 155 Manhattan Project scientists, was influenced primarily or at least to a large extent by racism? No, I don't think, I don't think that was the dominant issue at that time. Um, it, that has been a discussion later. If you look at the bombing of Dresden, if you look at the use of conventional weaponry throughout Germany, uh, the, it was murderous against white uh, German people. So there, there, certainly there was racism of, around, but I think the bombings were indiscriminate and quite brutal in many parts of the, that time. And as you see the military use, uh, let me, the US military leadership attempted to stop the bombing before it started. I don't believe racism was a dominant figure, dominant, there certainly was a great deal of racism but I don't think that was dominant in the decision-making. So let me just add to that. So far as we know, the, the momentum of the decision-making at that point in time in the top, top leadership was not the military. They were trying to stop it in a way. They were trying to put in terms that would give the emperor and the Japanese leadership assurances at the Potsdam conference that they could surrender without losing the ceremonial position of the God Emperor at that, that point. That was not where the, the drive was coming. It was coming from the diplomatic side. And it was about, it was about issues about the post-war world and about controlling Asia and about dominance in Europe. That's the thinking that was right at the center, the very center of the decision-making. It was not the military and it was not about racism, although racism, there certainly was great racism. But I think they would have used this bomb in, in Germany as well. They, they devastated German cities one after another with conventional bombing. As we. As we close here, I want to thank each of our uh, panelists uh, for really the wisdom and the knowledge that they've uh, shared with us uh, and the commitments that they've brought to this uh, work for a nuclear weapons free world for a very long time. Uh, I want to also just uh, interject here. Uh, about a week ago, I was on a, a webinar, a, actually a planning meeting uh, with Lawrence Wilkerson, uh, who was um, uh, Colin Powell's uh, chief of staff when he was Secretary of Defense. Uh, and Wilkerson said that uh, when Mattis was the Secretary of Defense in tr Trump's first years, he issued an order that no serious military actions uh, were to be taken without his express approval. The reason being his concern that Trump might, uh, in one of his rash moments, um, initiate a nuclear war. Uh, Mattis is out. Uh, we don't know uh, what, what orders are his successor has to put in place. Uh, and we, I think it should sober all of us in terms of just how important and urgent the work for nuclear disarmament is uh, in, in this moment. Um, uh, also, just to say that uh, there was a question uh, that we didn't get to uh, about the uh, anti-nuclear movement and the Poor People's Campaign. Uh, focusing on the $740 billion uh, military budget uh, that both uh, increases the probability of war and profoundly weakens our society uh, and suffering of many people among us. Uh, I know that 
uh, UFPJ, American Friends Service Committee, the campaign, have worked closely with the Poor People's Campaign. Uh, we're happy to have had Reverend Theo Harris uh, on this and, and other calls. Uh, but the answer to that question uh, really lies with those of you who are on this call uh, and what you do. Uh, and you can you know, go to the Poor People's Campaign uh, webpage to uh, find ways that you can engage and support them. So then let me move to, to close. And uh, I think Marianne Fernandez has a, um, a, a, a kind of a poster that she can put up here uh, that people can see. Um, I hope that all of you on this call, uh, this webinar, have found it as helpful as I have. As you know, it was organized for more than educational value. Our goals are to encourage local events, visual and in-person, to urge reflection about the crimes against humanity that were the Hiroshima and Nagasaki uh, A-bombings, uh, to reflect on the nature of state violence today, domestic and international, and nuclear, uh, and to build a movement for nuclear weapons abolition and to more deeply integrate campaigning for peace and justice. There are a host of actions that you can take, uh, but there are several that we want to highlight. Uh, you can initiate or join an event between August 6th and 9th as part of Gensukyo's Peace Wave. You can sign and circulate the Hibakusha Signature Appeal, which at last count had more than 10 million signatures and uh, really needs, needs, needs more uh, before it's presented to the uh, United Nations. And this is one thing that you can do uh, during that uh, global peace wave. You can support the Poor People's Campaign's moral budget and, uh, and the, both the Poor People's Campaign and Black Lives Matter events in the coming weeks and months. Other events, there are other events that you can enjoy, uh, rather uh, engage with. Uh, GAR will be participating in two initiated by Peter Kuznick uh, at American University. Uh, the World Conference Against a &H Bombs will be held this year online because of the uh, pandemic. Uh, and uh, Hiroshima and Nagasaki 95, uh, here in the United States uh, will be all day video streaming uh, on both August 6th and August 9th, uh, promoting activities that people are doing around the country, uh, presenting analysis and urging campaigns. We've also provided a link to a fact sheet about the Hiroshima and Nagasaki A-bombings that you can draw on for letters to the editor, op-eds, uh, and in your outreach and organizing. Uh, in closing, just to say that, as I think many of you know, we've recorded uh, this webinar. Uh, we will be posting uh, the link to it uh, so that you can use it both uh, for, for research or going back to check on details, but also to share with others as we build for a nuclear weapons free, uh, a just uh, and peaceful world. Uh, so thank you very much for joining us. And, uh, you know, the reality is uh, we need you to take action uh, in the coming weeks and months. Thank you for joining. Great, great. Thank you for Mariana. Thank you for giving us this opportunity to kind of talk with one another and debrief a little bit. Yeah. Um, uh, gorgeous. Thank you so much for joining us. I think. No, please. We're not. I'm finishing this, and we need to enter again. Please.